I'd like to think there's a few people who come here to the Luck on Sunday studio that I could realistically call a game changer. My guest today very much fits that category, but he is very, very rarely seen. He's changed the role of the jockey's agent. The era now is of the super agent, though agent itself is a word that he might reject. He prefers to call himself a man who books jockey's rides, but it's been a whole load more than that because he's been responsible for the champion jockey for the last 24 years. 20 with Sir Anthony McCoy, the last four with Richard Johnson. His first great success story was Adrian Maguire and those extraordinary bitter tussles for the championship that ultimately proved fruitless with Richard Dunwoody. But he's booked rides for some of the very best for so long and is a great spotter of young talent as well. A rare outing out of his control centre for Dave Roberts. Dave, good morning, welcome. Good morning, Nick. Nice it, to be here. It, it takes us a while to pin some people down. It took us a long time to get you because simply leaving home is quite hard for you, isn't it? It's a very rare occurrence, yeah. I mean, like today, while your programme's going on, I'm still doing the declarations for Chepstow and Air tomorrow. And basically, you've got to be on the phone 20 hours a day this time of year. It's a busy time of year. And while I'm enjoying being here, if I wasn't, I'd be on the phone ringing for rides for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, because all the entries are out. And simply, that has become the way. And, and in, in a sense, it's partly the way you've shaped the role. You've become it's, an architect of your own slavery to the job, essentially. Yeah, you, you, I've set a precedent where you do work them silly hours. Um, and if you let your guard down, there's now other agents who are doing great jobs trying to come through. And they're your competitors. You, you know, you've got to be on the ball all the time. You am mustn't. I, am I right in saying that agent is a word that you don't particularly like because it conjures up images of sort of greedy football agents and so forth. You're I, a man I who books rides. I would never say I'm an agent. I would describe myself as a salesman of jockeys. That is exactly how I see my role. Agent is a glamorous title which someone gave me 18 years ago, but it's, it doesn't come anywhere near what people imagine a football agent is. And am I right in saying that nobody grows up wanting to be a jockey's agent? It is a, it's, it's, it's a career path you find yourself going down. Um, unless you want... Unless you... If you want to have a social life, you definitely don't want to become a jockey's agent. And you've got to be of a certain mentality where you're prepared to lock yourself away for hours and hours on end. And it is obsession is the only word I can use it. Did, did you know you were of that temperament anyway? Or is this just something you've trained yourself to do? Um, we, when we were brought up as kids, me and my two brothers, we were, um, for due to situations, we were sent to work quite early and it was my dad put a very strong work ethic in us so I knew from a very early age I wanted to work for myself and but he always said to us you know if you put the hours in you'll get the rewards and I've lived by that all my life. So what was your first ever job you say you were sent to work quite early how first, early? E first ever job I was probably doing three paper rounds at the age of seven or eight something like that would be my first job I'd say. And even at that age did you did you understand the the, the reward work ratio and yeah, yeah the work ethic paid off if if you most paper boys were going in doing one and going home I was doing three and going, being late for school so and in, and if they wanted the fourth one done I'd do that as well uh, did you enjoy that loved it yeah I'd be up at half five same as today nowadays and I'd get down to the paper shop and off we went and used to love it yeah did you enjoy beating the other paper boys or did you enjoy the money. Uh, I think I enjoyed doing more than one paper round if they were only doing one, yeah. So that, that competitive instinct was in you? Very, from a very early stage, it was, yeah, I was very competitive in everything I did. Um, but I always thought very fair. You know, I didn't, I, it wasn't um, trying to prove anybody was less than me, but I always thought the more you put in, if you're going to prepare to go that bit extra, you, things will happen. Uh, and, and you say your father instilled that work ethic in you. Is that something for which you're you're quite grateful, or was he a hard taskmaster? Um, both, but very grateful. Yeah, he put us on the road, so both my brothers have done very well, and we're all, you know, a whole family is a very hard-working family, and my children are now grandchild. I hope they, you know, learn that from me and follow that on. And is that something that you were able to instil in your own children? Because a lot of people can't replicate that generation to generation, because if, if your own father's been hard on you, you find it quite hard to do that to your own um, kids. I think they, they've got... They've, they've taken that from me, but my son wanted to take over the role from me and I encouraged him totally straight away <laughs> from it because he would have no life. So, um, But no, they're both very hard-working and been successful in their own 
field, so it's great, yeah. So as I say, you don't, you don't set out to become a jockey's agent, but you did set out to, to get involved with horse racing. Why? What sparked the love of racing? I was, um, again, my dad had a big interest in racing. Uh, my schooling wasn't great. I used to skive off school and get on the 218 bus and go to Sandown, stand outside and wait for the old lady with her carrier bag coming along and say, would you get me in through the turnstile? And she used to take me in as her grandchild and off Brilliant. I went. Brilliant. So from a young age, I was walking around Sandown on my own at eight, nine years old, yeah. And what sort of era was that? Um, Can you remember who the big players were when we When we were kids, the three brothers, funny, because Jeff Lewis um, was my hero and my other brothers was Jimmy Lindley and Joe Mercer. And the person who got me into being a jockey's agent was Jeff Lewis. Really? Which is quite... I'm very a great believer in things happen and there's a lot of coincidences in life. And um, Jeff Lewis was the one who suggested me being a jockey's agent all those years later when he was a trainer. But the road from being someone who was just working on the periphery of racing to being an agent and taking that first jockey on your books, it was an interesting one. There were some interesting twists and turns along the way. I was with Oliver Sherwood the other day and he said, well, Dave Roberts, he said he was racing manager to one of my first ever owners back in the 80s. Yeah, I did. I used to manage some horses for an Indian businessman and we sent the horse to the jumpers to Oliver and um, showing me age now, but Clive Cox as a conditional rode the horse tack deer to win the first race at Sandown. Wow. Which, I hate to show you what my age is now, but that shows the time I've been in racing, yeah. So how long did that last? Uh, about three or four years, and then I, he, he sold the horses and went to America, and I had to sort of make a decision. I wanted to work in racing. I'd built up good contacts by then, and um, I stumbled into Jeff Lewis, who trained our flat horses at the time, and we were round his house one night and he just says, you know, I said to him, is there anything you can give me an idea why I should do? And he said, um, why don't you become a jockey's agent? I said, what's a jockey's agent? I, there was no such thing at the time. And he explained and off I went. Jason Swift was the first jockey I took on, which was, I think his godson, I think. So it was Jason Swift and then he lived with Dean Gallagher. Mm -hmm. And Dean Gallagher was my first jump jockey who then recommended Richard Guest and the rest is history. So it was Dean Gallagher, Richard Guest, and then, then dare I say it, the turning point. That was the big, the big moment came when, because um, Richard Guest rode for Toby. Yes, Toby um, Balding. Of course, Toby Balding, the great Toby Balding. Um, and he said to me one day, you know, would you take on this young jockey from Ireland for me? And Adrian Maguire came on the scene who to this day is definitely the greatest jump jockey that was never champion jockey. Adrian Maguire was how old when you first clapped eyes on him? He was um, late teens, a um, bit raw, but you could tell very quickly he was very good. A bit like when AP came on the scene, he was very good. He was totally switched on to winning and well above average. It was quite early to tell. You know, In the early days, you knew you'd got something special on your hands. People talk about Sir Anthony McCoy, A.P. McCoy, as a turning point in the way that jockeys thought about the sport, their professionalism. Would you say that Adrian Maguire was, in his own way, a bit of a culture shock for the sport and the culture of riders? I think Adrian, he was probably the first kind of lad who came from Ireland who made it big here. And his riding style was slightly different to the English jockeys of the day. So I think he did change things um, from people's attitude to the game. And he was very hungry and he was going up and down the country. Or we, we were, as I call it, we, we'd, we're a team. So we're going up and down the country together. And um, so other people had to do the same. You know, we, we flew to Hexham from Market Raisin and things that was never been heard of. So, so did you think to yourself, hang on a minute, I'm onto something. I, I, did you feel that you'd, you'd found your niche in life at that point? Well, at the time, there was one other agent who was Richard Dunwoody's agent, um, Robert Kingston. Yeah. And no one else. And I was ringing for rides and thinking, well, there's no, there's no competition. It was quite, not easy, but it was, well, you can place jockeys here, there. And um, so, yeah, you stumbled on a real gap in the market and there was no looking back. You know, just make the most of it. It was Maguire and Dunwoody. Yeah. Then it was... Dunwoody and McCoy. Richard Dunwoody must have hated you. I don't think I come out very well in his books or whatever, but, um, no, but you know, at the time, Richard was um, the number one. He 
ruled the roost and someone was trying to come along and find a way in. So I don't think I was his... Uh, I wouldn't have been on his Christmas list anyway, put it like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I always respect him. He was a great jockey and as a jockey you could only respect him for what he achieved, yeah. Oh, he was a brilliant rider. Oh, yeah. Brilliant artist Richard and Dunwoody. Oh, the, the AP would always say he was, you know, one of the best ever. So I always had respect for him as a jockey, but um, I would have sent him a Christmas card. I don't think he would have sent me one. Did his presence there as the sort of dominant presence as a man of great experience and someone who everyone sort of revered, did that spur you on? Did that give you the target to aim at first with Maguire and then with McCoy? I think the year that Adrian lost on the last day, well, it's not really losing, he came second on the last day. I think um, to ride that many winners, 190 winners plus in a season and not be champion That's jockey, hurt. is you, you can't really ever repeat that. Um, but it made me as an agent stroke salesman um, far more I want to get a champion jockey you know I have to and it want, at that time it was obviously Adrian that he wanted to be champion and then of course along came AP which surpassed them both I don't suppose you're a man who who looks back with too many regrets and, and, and nor should you but do you look back and and kick yourself that Adrian Maguire wasn't champion jockey because you were close to him um, I am, you're right. I don't. I, I, in my belief in life, you should never have regrets. But there's two. One, Adrian should have been champion jockey. With that, and I think most people would agree with that. And the other one, you might touch on later, is that AP should have got to 300 in the year he got injured. So, well, we but will. they're the only two regrets I have. We will come to that later. Is there anything you could have done differently for the first one? For Adrian, when you look back, there's always things. You know, you're, you're picking two in a race and. When you lose by two or three, there's many. In the last month, I would guess there was 20, 25 races where you had to pick one or the other. And you're not going to get it right. You get it Sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong. And for weeks after the season finished, I did look at those races and think, should we have ridden that one, should we have ridden that one? But you can't turn the clock back. So AP McCoy came along. Adrian McGuire was still... Still, still going strong. Still going very strong. At the time, and that Maguire Dunwoody thing could have continued. But yes. Here's this sensation. How quickly was it apparent to you that he was a, a real sensation? Um, similar to with the, the great Toby again, similar. He um, sent me a video, and you know, I've got this young boy again. And after what happened with Adrian, you knew that um, Toby wouldn't be sending me a video unless this was something out of the ordinary. And we looked at the video, and I went to Plumpton. Great story. I went to Plumpton to meet him. First time I ever met him in the tote betting shop and Adrian Maguire rode the first five winners at Plumpton. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, that's what I want to be. That's what I want to do. And straight away, you, you, he started riding and everybody was using him because he was a long way in front of the conditionals in that, in that era. Do you think there were people who were using him who, who still almost didn't believe in him but just got carried along on the tide and thought, well, if I don't, then somebody else will. I think as, it, as time went on, um, a lot of very good judges would say to me, if I don't use him, it's seven pound I haven't got. If I do use him, I've got that seven pound advantage. So if he's riding A and not B, and really that's like a 14 pound swing in, in their minds. So people wanted him on board. It, and, and his feedback after races, people, trainers, that's the only thing I can go on is how trainers give you feedback, mm -hmm. you know, how your jockeys have performed. And everyone said the moment he rode a horse, finished sixth or seventh, but the feedback would be brilliant. And so the you horse were getting that straight away? Yeah. It was very early days. How much do you pay attention to the, the mechanics of race riding, what jockeys are actually doing physically through a race? Or is, be, it all, is, it, is it all on paper for you? I've never ridden, so I've never. I've always said, and to AP as well, to any of the jockeys, I would never tell them how to ride a horse because I've never ridden. Um, but you can watch and you've got an eye for if they've done something slightly, not wrong, but they're in the wrong place or they may have could have done something else or if a horse needs to come late and they get there too soon. But the times I think I help them is, say, using Fontwell as an example, when it's very heavy ground, you'd always go round the wide outside. Graham Bradley was brilliant at it. Um, so with the younger jockeys, if Fontwell's on and it's heavy ground, you'd, I'd send them a message mm. to say, just remember, you know, round the outside, the ground's seven, eight lengths quicker. And 
So you try and help them. Lane Aspel, another one of your riders, is the is the past master of that nowadays. You've probably got him onto that. They all go around the outside now. That's the problem. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, back to McCoy. At what stage did at what stage did looking after him become something very different as a personal experience for you? Because clearly we saw it in the latter stages when he got past 4,000 winners and he made the movie and we started to know a bit more about you and your relationship. You were very, very tight, very close. Yeah. But you were trying to look after all these other jockeys at the time. When did it become a sort of different experience, do you think? I think um, when he was champion conditional, that's what we set out to do. And in that year, we spent quite a lot of time talking, not necessarily seeing, because I never go out of the office, but <laughs> verbally over the phone we were talking quite a lot. And just talking to him, you you knew you were dealing with someone with a very sharp brain and was so focused um, to the point of obsession. And I know that's how I've done my job. So we kind of hit it off perfectly. And there was no sign of it. There's never any doubt of it. Just say tomorrow if I said you've got one ride at air, um, it's a three to one chance, you know, you can go or you can't. You, you, you wouldn't even ask the question, he'll be there, he'll go and ride it. He trusted me totally, I trusted him and we just formed a very unusual working relationship, I think, which become a great friendship. So because there's no aggro, there's double the productivity? Yeah, there's never, we never had one crossword and if I picked the wrong horse or he picked the wrong horse and, um, you know, it, there was never any aftermath, it was just carry on the next day and away we went. I mean, the great story of Don't Push It is if it was down to me or AP, we wouldn't have ridden it. We'd have ridden the other one. So it was all down to John Joe. So if there's one crucial difference I can detect between you and he, it's you don't look back and regret necessarily and beat yourself up over past what you would perceive, you wouldn't perceive to be failures, but he definitely would. I mean, he did yeah. it again the other day. Yeah, yeah. In he, an interview. We've now got water under the bridge. I see him around the place. He's much more relaxed than he yeah. was. Yeah, he, he, he would look back and, yeah, he would analyse every race and if he got beat a short head on one, what could I have done? I surely could have done something different. He believed he could win every race he went out on, no matter what the horse was. So could you, do you think you could put him straight a tiny bit mentally when he was really d- drilling himself? You um, just recenter him a little bit? I think my job was just to keep the positivity going and if it wasn't such a great day as, you know, my, my kind of, if he didn't, have, say he had four favourites at Plumpton today and they all got beat, I'd say, yeah, but I've just got you to ride on the favourite in the Gold Cup. You know, there's, there's a way of kind of making things better. You know, you're, no, you're going to ride best mate in the King George. Oh, great. You know, so you, yeah. you're picking them up. But you do that with all the jockeys. You've got to keep their confidence up and keep telling them that, you know, the future is not about today. You could have a terrible day today, but tomorrow you could go and ride a treble. So how did you not get to 300 with a man who could do anything? Well, you know, I mean, it's, as I say, I don't have regrets and I know it's his and... It was mine. We were so far in front of um, all the records that he'd set and the figures. It was you were you were pinching yourself. I think this just can't be happening, you know. And it was just one fall. Another day, that horse would have fallen. He'd have gone the other way, not got a kick, and he would have definitely got to three hundred. And that was what we wanted to do because that, you know, I, I don't think anybody will ever break the record of winners in a season. But to get to three hundred would have been totally off the scale you know so if there is a regret that is that and Adrian not being champion they are the two yeah now clearly at the time you're looking after AP he's in an impregnable position it seemed at the head of the jockey championship and Richard Johnson finished second to him how many times out of the 20? 16 16 out of the 20 and he's had his very late in the day coronation now with with four of his own championships how did you square that with yourself that you had a guy in Richard Johnson who you were representing representing is maybe the wrong word, whose ride you were booking, and you had this guy who you couldn't get past, and you had a duty to make AP champion jockey, but you had a duty to Richard Johnson at the time. How, do you, how did you square that with yourself? Well, at the end of the day, when you, when you start each season, everybody can be champion jockey. Um, and as an agent, I keep saying agent, I get, as, as a salesman, you're trying to make AP champion jockey, you're trying to make Richard Johnson champion jockey, you're trying to make Mick Fitzgerald. My, my job is all based on figures. I've always said it's on how many winners my jockeys ride each season. Um, they, yeah, we all want to win the Grand National, the Gold Cup, but to me that's not really. Mine's on figures. Because um, they so, come as a natural byproduct. Exactly. Um, but with when AP were Richard were first and second in the title for that many years, I did the same job for both of them. And if there were times, and there was times, if you ring up and said, have you got a jockey for 
Newbury on Saturday, who's available, AP or Dickey? And they, on a few occasions, they said, well, you, you choose. I said, no, no, you choose. You know, I always make the point saying, you choose. I'm, I'm giving you both jockeys. It's up to you which one rides it. And there was times people would pick Dickey and there was times people would pick AP. Um, I look at it and think the fact he was runner-up 16 times, much as how heartbreaking that was, was a great achievement. And that's why when AP gave up, it was massive for me that Dickey became jo champion jockey. Yeah. Having ha what happened with Adrian as well. That was a massive thing for me that Dickie became champion jockey at least once. And uh, do you find yourself as obsessional now in chasing the championship for, for Richard as you did for every Sir every Every year you start the season, if you're doing your job right, you want to get the champion jockey. If you look at the racing how I do, which is on numbers, you know, it's, it's, if I was a football manager, I'd want to win the Premier League. If I wouldn't want to win the Champions League, I'd want to win the Premier League because that's the goal. Is it fair of me to suggest that this season is going to be your most interesting championship struggle since about 1995? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it, things change. You know, Brian Hughes is doing really well. Sam Twiston Davis is not far behind. Um, the scores are level. We've turned the new year, so four months to go and let the best man win. But I know myself and I know for Dickey, I can't speak for... Brian and Sam, but for myself and Dickie, we, it won't be through lack of trying. You know, we'll do everything we can, and if it happens, it happens. It doesn't, it doesn't. But you've got to remember in this game, whatever jockey you're dealing with, and it's you know, it's something I always say to myself every day when when I go home now and watch Plumpton today. If all your jockeys come home at the end of the day in one piece, that's the most important thing. You know, it, it's the most. Important it's the thing. only thing that matters. It's, mm. Yes, as I said, you could have a terrible day. You could you know, ride four odds on favourites and all get beat and beat yourself up, but you're coming home. Tomorrow's a different day. And that's what you've got to believe as a jockey. When your riders get to a McCoy status, a Johnson status now, <clears throat> I'm not saying I'm not saying it all comes easily, but there is a certain metronomic regularity with which they ride winners and we expect them to ride winners. When you as a jockey ride booker, come mm -hmm. agent, come salesman, yep. however you want to put it, find find one of your jockeys, an outside ride, and they go and win a huge race, that must give you a real kick. That's, How that's, often does that, that happen? That's, that's, that's when you get a buzz because, um, you know, spare rides, basically, there's, there's three or four agents now who are vying for those rides. So if you spot the spare ride and you get one of your jockeys on and it wins, um, that gives you a a nice little buzz and you think oh, that's great you know that's and it's nice if the younger jockeys have their day as well you know I, I act for Rex Dingle for example mm. for with Jepak you know for a young jockey to win a race like that that's not a spare ride but it's nice when the younger jockeys get their chance as well and um, yeah over the years there's been some great bookings of spare rides which you know have rewritten history so go on which has been the most resonant the two that with come, you well the two that would come to mind was um, Rough Quest when he ran at Nottingham on a Saturday afternoon when there was jump racing mm -hmm. at Nottingham and Mick Fitzgerald, Mr Dunwoody, in his infinite wisdom, decided not to go there, so <laughs> Mick got on it and um, kept the ride and, of course, won the Grand National, so that was a great booking. And the other one would be Andrew Thornton um, when he won on Cool Dawn at Ascot and it only had 10 stone 2, mm -hmm. which I had no intention of thinking he would do it and I rung him, say, on the Wednesday and said, oh, you can ride Cool Dawn on Saturday. I said, it's only got 10 2. And he said, you're joking. I said, no, no, you can, you can ride it. He said, oh, no, he said, you're joking. It's got 10 2. I said, well, do you want to do it or not? And he said, no, I'll do it. I'll do it. And he did. He got himself down to 10 2, won on it, and the rest is history. Won the Gold Cup, which, you know, it's, so moments like that are great. And, and you, you're, you're not only changing the course of history, but you're forging personal relationships between jockeys and trainers. The relationship between Andrew thereafter and, and Robert and Sally Ulmer is a, a legendary one. Yeah, and that was a spare ride. So you, you, you've changed Andrew's career in that sense because it's opened up massive, um, you know, this is the race now, but it's, it's, it's opened up uh, avenues to him which revitalised his career. Well, it's heartbreaking if, like me, you back strong promise. But <laughs> <laughs> That was one of mine on that as well. So. Norman William, was it Norman <laughs> yeah, Williamson, yeah, yeah. wasn't it, on strong promise? Well, luckily enough, we had the one-two coming up the hill that day, yeah. And again, I, it, it, reminiscent of um, Edredon Bleu and Direct Route in that yes, memorable champion exactly. chase you were on. You were yeah, on the winner and the second. Which one won that, did it? <laughs> yeah, so, but again, it's, they're all... Um, direct Route would have spare ride. AP would have ridden Edredon Bleu. 
anyway. So if you were looking at it from a selfish point of view, maybe direct route would have been a little bit more of a buzz because it was a spare as mm. opposed to someone who always rides the other one. But Cheltenham's Cheltenham. If, if you have a winner there, it's great. Yeah. So actually, when, do you remember watching the finish of that race? Yeah, I was hoping for a dead heat, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> And that's another one. That's told, one each on the board. You've then. never told Sir Anthony you would go, go on, Norman, all the way out the running. <laughs> one for the spares. Yeah, but it's just two winners then on the board for the season, you see. Yeah, yes, I suppose if you look so at it I'm like quite that. happy with dead heats all the time if they're both my jockeys. Spot on. So how many jockeys are you looking after at the moment? 34 professional jockeys. And that's not the highest you've been, is it, numerically? No, I've come down a little bit. Um, 34 jockeys and conditionals about 14 now. Which is not, I think there are people who've got mm. more jockeys than myself. Now, it doesn't so. sound like an outlandish <coughs> number, but <coughs> at your peak, you know, there were plenty of people saying, this it can't be healthy, he shouldn't have this many jockeys, it's not good for the game, it's a monopoly, it's this, that and the other. Did you ever think about that, or did you just get on with the job? Um, I've never ever had a contract with any jockey. You know, they're all free to come and go, um, and same with me, if I, we don't get on or something doesn't work. So I've never ever tried to tie them down to contracts. I've always said, you know, they're free agents. They mm. can stay with me or go and try someone else. And I always say, if it doesn't work, come back, leave the door open. Um, but no, you just get on with it. But if, if you can do 34 jockeys, why can't you do 54? Mm. I think if you do one jockey and then you do two, it's kind of a conflict of interest. If you're spending all that time on, just for, say, um, AP. And then I say, well, I'm going to take on Ruby Walsh. But it's a conflict of interest. Whereas if you're doing 34, to do 54, does it, if you're doing does the same it? job for them all, does it really make any difference? Not. So I just put my head down and got on with it, yeah. Are you conscious of the, of the control you have over the game? I don't think I've got control over the game at all. I, I, all I, I mean, I hear or read sometimes people say this control thing, but I don't, because all I say to, and the other agents, I'm sure they're the same as me. You know, you get up in the morning at half five, you're in the office by quarter to six. The first phone call this morning was 10 to six. You get in the office and you work away. Mm. It's not controlling, it's just being on the phone and being on the ball. And you're in that tunnel vision of um, until that last ride's booked. You, you, you know, if you're doing your job right, until that last ride's booked, you've got to be on the phone. And, but it's also you've got to spot, like we're saying about getting a good spare, you've got to work out for argument's sake if um, using, say, one of Chris Broad's, or say Sam Twist and Davis. Yeah. If, Sam, if you know Sam's going to ride something for Nigel at Wing Canton on Saturday. That's a perfect example. So you would ring Dr Newland and say, oh, you know, Sam's at Wing Canton, if you need a jockey at Sandown. So it's spotting the gaps as well and the opportunities, which you only do by putting the hours in. It's, it's not going to happen if you get up at 8 o'clock and then at half 10 say, oh, I'm finished for the day now, I'm off and going racing. Well, that's why I never go racing, because you, you should be on the phone minimum 12 hours a day, minimum. You... you quite rightly and, and very cogently rejected the notion of control. You wouldn't, however, reject the notion that you are a game changer. You have changed, you have changed the way the sport is run in, in many respects, haven't you? Um, from the job I do, I think at the time when I started doing it, changed the game. Um, in those days, jockeys used to ring up for the rides or trainers would find jockeys. Um, I'd like to think that trainers think it's a help that if I ring up and Say on Saturday, for a perfect example, Chris Gordon, um, Tom Cannon had, he's a ban at the moment, so he's off. So Chris had one at Sandown, two at Wing Canton. So you ring up and he used three of my jockeys. It saves him making lots of calls and if you're offering him the jockeys you know he likes. Um, so you like to think you're making their job easier as well. If you've got to ring three different agents for three different jockeys, it's time consuming. And So I think you, I like to look and think I'm actually helping them have an easier way of doing things and rather than control. I don't think control is the right word. I think anybody could do the job I'm doing if they want to sit in the bunker for 12 to 15 hours a day. Come and join us. What's the bunker like? <clears throat> You've got to make um, it comfortable for yourself, presumably. It's, it's, it's quite nice and from about when the last race finishes, it's full of red wine and normally gets cracked <laughs> open about half past three every day. So, yeah. So, but no, it's, it's just a place where I go and I've worked there for years and you just have to, it's just going into the tunnel vision and concentrating on what you're doing and just like being a jockey preparing to ride and you know I'm preparing each day for, the, I know what meetings say Tuesday are Lingfield and Taunton, in my mind now I know where my jockeys are going but a trainer who rides say Rex Dingle, Anthony Honeywell's got interest at two meetings on Tuesday, um, 
I know where Rex is going, but if in the morning if Anthony says, oh, well, mm. look, unfortunately that horse is lame, can't run, so Rex has got to go to the other meeting. So you're all planning ahead, a long way in advance. Um, Rex Dingle, one of the many young, talented jockeys you've got coming through. You've got James Bowen as well on your books. You look after Sean, do you look after Sean, Sean Bowen as well? Yeah. yeah. Two very uh, exciting young talents. Who... Who are you really pinning your hopes on as the next, as the next big I, thing? I, I, I never, ever would put one jock in front of the other because I could go Connor Brace, Jack Tudor, Brian Carver. Now you're just getting greedy. I don't know, but, but they, <laughs> at the start of the season, they're jockeys that you've not necessarily heard that much of. You know, it's, mm. it's getting them the chances to prove their talents. Um, Luca Morgan, you know, he's joined Ben Paul and he's doing well. There's lots of young jockeys... Um, it goes on forever, so I don't like to mention one name, but um, young jockey. No, I think it's a bit unfair because okay. I'm a great believer, and I, I said earlier to your friend there, that I was a great believer. If if you're going to be a salesman for jockeys, you have to believe in that jockey. Otherwise, you shouldn't take them on. You know, you, you've got to believe that they're going to do you uh, proud and. If you don't want to be their agent, that's fine. Don't be their agent. But there's, it's quite easy just to take a jockey on for the sake of taking them on. So all the young jockeys I do, and I love helping the young jockeys, and I love getting them opportunities of, um, you know, when, as you say, with a spare, when they shouldn't be on. And when they win, that does give you that little bit of extra. Like Brian Carver had a treble at Exeter. I mean, you know, you walk away and think, you know what, well, that's... Probably changed that young lad's and, and how he career. won the mayor's hurdle and the bumper. Only you will ever know because exactly. it was all in the fog exactly, and we couldn't yeah. see anything. <laughs> he told me a great story. <laughs> well, you can tell us after the yeah. break, but for the moment, Dave Roberts has been fascinating. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Dave Roberts will be joined after this break by Lorne Hill and Lee Mottishead as we round off the programme to 11.30. Subscribe to Racing TV to be notified when more Luck on Sunday videos are appearing online and don't forget to join me for the show every Sunday morning from nine o'clock with the best guests.